You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the fourth Doctor story, The Pirate Planet. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Eakin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to get your very own Secrets of Doctor Who t-shirt or phone case or mug uh, or more by visiting sqpn.com slash merch. And I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Technology. And you can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash technology. So, like I said, today we're discussing the fourth Doctor story, The Pirate Planet. Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens? This week, the fourth Doctor and Romana go searching for the second segment of the Key to Time. They try to land on the planet Calufrax, but when they do so, they end up somewhere unexpected. It turns out that they've landed on Xanak, the, a, a planet that cures indigestion. I mean... Uh, <laughs> they've landed on Xanak, a pirate planet that has teleported around Calufrax in order to mine it and steal its wealth. The pirates running the planet are captained by a cyborg named the Captain, who has a robotic space murder parrot. And the Captain is under the thumb of the planet's queen, Xanxia, who is biologically frozen in the last few moments of her life, but she goes about gallivanting around in a, bo in a holographic body that she believes is about to become real. Against these villains is a local group of telepaths called the Mentiads, who are growing stronger with each planet Xanax savages. Uh, but the captain uses crystals from Calufrax to build a psychic jamming device to shut them down. The doctor gets Canine to jam the psychic jammer, so their abilities start to come back. And there isn't much time, because now that Calufrax is gone, and in fact has been shrunk to less than a foot in size, Xanak is about to jump again and destroy the Earth. The Doctor and Romana use the TARDIS to try to materialize at the same time as Xanak, thus preventing it from enveloping the Earth. And with the help of the Mintiads, they smash equipment in Xanak's engine room. Afterwards, they blow up the bridge where the Captain and Queen Xanxia were based, leaving the Mintiads and the other Xanaxians to establish a new free civilization on their now non-traveling planet. The Doctor also realizes that the second segment of the Key to Time was actually the now-shrunken planet Calufrax, and off-screen and after the episode, he and Romana use the TARDIS to retrieve it and turn it back into a segment of the Key to Time. The end. So, um, since I'm the only one who hasn't seen this before, I'll start with uh, giving you all my first impressions of this story. And... Uh, I it was relatively pleasant. Uh, you know, you know, I, I really, uh, I like this one. I like the mixture of Douglas Adams, who is the writer of this episode, his sensibilities, his humor with the fourth doctor's wackiness. I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought there were a lot of fun little moments that they, that the doctor got in this one. Uh, the overall story, I, not a huge fan of the captain, but I did like the, uh, different elements that showed up uh among the, the i felt it was a, there was a complex series of uh, characters uh interactions throughout uh between the different parties that were involved like, i don't know if it's complex is the word but there was a lot of different interest in in throughout that so uh i thought the doctor got a lot to do romana got some stuff to do and even canine so it was it was fun i enjoyed this one father cory i see this is one i've always enjoyed of course you know first time i saw it i was a kid you know, and you know, it, it plays very much into a kid's imagination, you know, the, the captain with his constant bluster and, and almost maniacal glee at times and and the, the pirate the, 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 the pirate parrot and you know the robo parrot that K9 eventually fetches and and all that, you know, all, and of course Douglas Adams' sense of humor. It very much, you know, this was the first thing he wrote for Doctor Who. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but um he uh, his humor is interspersed throughout sometimes very subtle you know douglas adams is known for having these little subtle quips that you have to kind of think about a little bit um yeah I, it's one i've always kind of enjoyed i mean it is silly um but it, it's it's one i've always really enjoyed and i was looking forward to watching it again jimmy what did you think 
Well, um, I think it's okay. I'm not a huge fan of this story. There are some things in it I like very much. I like very much the fact that uh, Calufrax, the entire planet, is a segment of the key to time. I like that they have that the captain has this collection of shrunken planets that are gravitationally balanced in some magically perfect way that couldn't really happen. That so they can he can have them in display cases and be walking between the display cases without the gravity of the planets tearing him apart. I think it's a cool idea. It's completely unrealistic, but it's a cool idea. I'm a little... So when I first read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is what Douglas Adams is most famous for, I said to myself and other people, it's, I, I was recommending the book to them saying, you should read this. It's like a combination of Doctor Who and Monty Python. And little did I know, Douglas Adams had written for Doctor Who at the time, Mm -hmm. and I believe he also wrote for Monty Python. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the sensibilities are are both right there. He actually wrote this script while he was selling um, the radio version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was the original version. It preceded the novels and the TV show and much later the movie. Um, So he was selling the original version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy at the same time that he was doing the script for Doctor Who. I'm a little surprised, and he later went on to like become script editor Mm -hmm. for Doctor Who. I'm a little surprised that it's not funnier. Uh, It doesn't have, he's clearly not writing for comedy the way he does in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is just straight sci-fi comedy. This is this has sci-fi comedy in it, but it's not a straight comedic work. And so it's not as funny as as I would have would have thought, given that it's by Douglas Adams. It does have some very Douglas Adams-y lines in it. Um, like there's one point where the 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 Doctor and Romana are marveling about all the crystals that have been mined. They don't know where the crystals have come from, but they've been mined from these planets that have been pirated. And they're so common, they're just laying in the street. And the Doctor finds a particularly rare crystal called Ulix, and he says, lying in the street, exactly where I wasn't expecting to find it. And that's a very Douglas Adams-y line. It's like in The Hitchhiker's Guide, the Vogon, we're told that the Vogon constructor fleet is made of spaceships that hang in the sky exactly the way that bricks don't. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, that's a very Douglas Adams-y line. Um, we do see elements, like not just the dialogue, but other things, of Douglas Adams' sense of humor peeking through the most obvious examples being the the pirate captain who is this incredibly loud blustery individual that is is you know he's he's a caricature he's he's a mm-hmm. almost a one dimension he's like a 1.2 dimensional character because he does eventually you know fight back against how the queen has been dominating him. But other than that, he's just a straight up, he's like Mr. Krabs, you know, mm-hmm. on SpongeBob. He's just a straight up caricature. All he does is yell and abuse people. And he has correspondingly this ultra obsequious, unctuous underling named Mr. Fibuli, who just, you know, oh, whatever you want, Captain, I'll do it immediately, you know, who's just terrified of him. And so you do get some kind of Adamsy humor with the captain and Mr. Fibuli. When it comes to the queen, now, at first we don't know she's the queen. She appears to be a nurse that's taking care of, or an assistant of some kind, that's taking care of the captain. And that's her holographic body. Her real body is aged, and we eventually see her real body and they had to pay the actress. It was one of the last things the actress ever did mm-hmm. in her long career. They had to pay her extra to take out her false teeth yeah. for, for the shot. She doesn't have any lines. She just sits there and, you know, vegetates in front of the camera. But the, in real life, she was sharp enough that when they said, can you take out your false teeth? She said, I want more money. Yeah. And, and they gave it to her. But the Douglas Adams originally planned for the queen to be the daughter of the master 
and who was in his decayed state now, as you may remember, um, in Tom Baker's run. And so she was going to be the daughter of the master and was like savaging planets that are pirating planets that had treated the master badly. Hmm. And either out of, and, and I think if I remember correctly, um, the master's daughter either like loved or hated her father. Yeah, I don't know that that had been decided. And then after a while, the master started, uh, Douglas Adams started thinking, hey, maybe she could just be a female incarnation of the master. Because he's in his decayed state right Mm -hmm. now, he could regenerate and become female. And so she was originally envisioned as a kind of proto-Missy. But he ultimately went with she's the queen of the planet of the antacids. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> or, it's, or is it Xanax, the antidepressants? I don't know. Sure no. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking was Xanax. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just knew it was a drug name. I've yeah, never yeah. been on yeah. that one myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, some other great line, like uh, Adamsy lines is, uh, you know, the doctor, when he arrives on the bridge, she says, uh, such hospitality, I'm underwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah that yeah. was a good one. And uh, there was some others there. A lot of the the humor that the the fourth doctor is remembered for is because of Douglas Adams, because as Jimmy mentioned, uh, he ended up being the uh, script editor in season 17. So he had lots of opportunities to put his uh, stamp on the the show, including uh, the episode City of Death, where he Mm -hmm. helped co-write write that as under a pseudonym, but he co-wrote that. And that's probably one of the most famous of the fourth doctor episodes because of the humor, uh, including John Cleese watching the TARDIS dematerialize, thinking it's an art. Show. Piece of art, yeah. <laughs> Piece of art, <laughs> right. and it's also, just a marvelous scene. Yeah, that one has lots of great humor in it. I, I love the line. At one point, um, the villain's butler attacks the doctor, yeah. and the doctor says, "What a marvelous butler! He's so violent." <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot, a lot of parallels in this between this and Hitchhiker's Guide, because like Jimmy mentioned, he was working on Hitchhi- uh, selling Hitchhiker's Guide at the time, so he was able to pull some of those elements in and switch them out. Also, parrots play a big thing in his writing, uh, including mm-hmm. the game uh, Starship Titanic, which was actually his last work. And parrots play a key point in that game. Mm-hmm. I never played it. I, now, now I want to go back and play it. There's a, I have the, uh, the DVD series set of, for the key to time and watch the uh, documentary or the, kind of, the interviews about Douglas Adams' uh, for this and you know it talks about some of the stuff that he pulls in uh, oh, that cool. we see in this so yeah there are also little references to like doctor who things in the hitchhiker's guide and hitchhiker references in doctor who so he kind of helped craft or insinuate that they're in the same universe mm-hmm. yeah i have to say i'm not a huge fan of the of the robotic space murder parent parrot um it's a little it's it the whole thing is on the nose and so, mm-hmm. you know, the pirate captain has a pirate space murder parrot, which actually looks more like a hawk to yeah. me than a parrot, but it's meant mm-hmm. to be a parrot. Yeah, you know, they, they do try in this story to to have a little bit of a little bit of misdirection at beginning at the beginning because the the Mentiads are initially come across as creepy and perhaps the bad guys they they look mm-hmm. like zombies uh they they uh psychically stalk people uh yeah. among the the xenaxians um, they, they have their th- around their eyes is blacked out like the george romero night of the living dead zombies and they have very pale skin mm-hmm. right right there was a great line about that though where where they, you know, when they first knock the doctor out at end of cliffhanger, the first, first episode, you know, of course, oh, they're the bad guys and they're attacking the doctor. And then later on, it, it said that they, they attacked him with good vibrations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. At one point, uh, the doctor says to one of the locals, uh, Kimus, I think it's his, the, his name was, uh, tells him don't panic, which is a, mm-hmm. the, f- the famous tagline from Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, and so, yeah, there's a little, a lot of, you could tell as a writer he was sort of sprinkling his some of his uh, thoughts <laughs> as he went through, unconsiously or consciously. I don't not sure, but yeah, they're they're in there. Oh, writers do that consciously. Before Babylon <laughs> Five, uh, J. Michael Straczynski had a series called Captain Power, and he would sprinkle. He, he was planning Babylon Five, and he would sprinkle Babylon Five things in it, like the phrase. And so it begins, <laughs> which is famous <laughs> from Babylon Five. Yep. 
Uh, I like Romani in this one. I, I kind of I'm enjoying her as a companion. I think she's uh, she's an interesting match for the Doctor. She's mm -hmm. very smart. She's uh, but the Doctor sort of disdains her as a as a uh, uh, too, oh, too smart for her own good young person compared to him. You know, and he's yeah. he's so much older than her, and it's kind of fun. And she's academy trained. She has all this book learning, whereas the Doctor mm -hmm. has street smarts. And I like, I, re, I have in my notes that I really liked Romana in this episode. I really like Romana. And Romana won because there will be a second incarnation of Romana mm -hmm. next season. Romana 2 is the more famous of the Romanas. Yep. And I like Romana 2, but I really like Romana mm -hmm. 1 in this rewatch. She is reminiscent. The, the previous companions that we've had that are kind of like her were Zoe in the second Doctor's time, who had enough yeah. science knowledge she could push back on the Doctor and do stuff. And a little bit, um, what's her name? Carolyn, the third Doctor's first companion. Liz Shaw. Oh, Liz yeah. Shaw, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Carolyn was, may have been the actress's name. Yep. But Liz Shaw, um, also, she had a science background. She could do things scientifically that are competent. And now we have Romana, who is in that same vein. But... Mm -hmm. Zoe, Liz, and Romana are three very different personalities. Yeah. And, you know, Zoe is young and spunky. Liz is scientific and competent. And uh, Romana is aristocratic. Yes. And so I have in my notes, Romana has nice mix of competence, aristocracy, pushback, because she mm -hmm. pushes back at the doctor, and subversive humor at the doctor's expense. She's, yeah. She'll frequently... She'll passive aggressively joke about him in his presence, mm -hmm. where yeah. you know he'll say something and it'll be like, "Whatever you say, Doctor," but you know she's <laughs> she's not convinced. Yeah. Well, as you're saying, they kind they kind of play on that. The uh, right at the beginning when the Doctor's trying to get people to, you know, tell him what's going on. He's trying to talk to people mm -hmm. and they're running away. Canine goes, "You should let Mistress talk to him. She's prettier than you." <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a good line. <laughs> good, good go in there, canine. And you know, when she's arrested by the uh, the captain's guard, she's she's very sassy to the to the captain. She's very like aristocratic, very posh toward him. Like uh, you know, as a, as if she's not actually under arrest, but just as being escorted by him. You know, mm, in the yeah. air car, and she she's very calm and at ease in, in that situation. Oh. <laughs> the air cars. So yeah. I remembered the air cars from previous watches of this, but what I did not remember is they are obviously boats. Yes. <laughs> they they put some little things on the side. This, yeah, <laughs> yeah. These are, these are just fiberglass boats that people would take out on the lake for fun. And they've, redress them as air cars <laughs> and they really didn't even do that much redressing of the interior they just put a little console between the two front seats and that was about it i mean right they yeah it, it kind of actually reminded me of the land speeders in uh star wars you know they're just kind of <laughs> floating around on hidden wheels yeah um so the, the on this on this planet which the doctor is thinks is supposed to be califrax and is xanax because it has appeared around califrax um there's this the doctor and Ramon has this dispute over, you know, w whether it is because Califrax supposed to be this frozen ice planet uninhabited. And this is obviously not. And uh, we encounter uh, this family, Pr Pralix, his sister, Mula, and their grandfather, Balaton. And then uh, family, Mula's family friend, yeah, possibly Ke boyfriend mm -hmm. of Mula. Yeah. And, yeah. Yep. Kimus. And, um, and, and Pralix is, sick life force dying is you know it keeps repeating so apparently the the native people of xanax are are latent telepaths some of them at least yeah, yeah. okay and there's a script inconsistency because we see the mintiads chanting life force dying as as they're going to this new planet and then later they don't know what life force is and it, and the doctor and Romana have to explain to them what life force is. It's like, do you guys remember that chant you were doing two episodes ago? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Kimus is uh, a bit of a rebel. He's, uh, you know, they have all the prosperity they could want. Like, like you said, literally jewels littering the streets and golden age of prosperity declared every once in a while. And, uh, but they have no freedom and that's, 
kind of an interesting little bit of social commentary thrown in there. The Doctor Who of this era, some you know, sometimes throws in a little of that social commentary. So you can have lots of prosperity, but very little freedom. And that so I thought that was interesting. The actor who plays Keemus, let me see what his name, David Warwick. Um, I was I'm familiar with him from another piece of 1970s British television. He played the son, his name was, character's name was Mark, but he played the son of Reginald Perrin on The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin. And he also was, he had the same kind of persona. He had a beard at the time. His Reginald Perrin referred to him as, oh, I see you've joined the Bearded Wonder Club. Um, but uh, he he also was like this young hippie not quite revolutionary but with revolutionary sentiments it's like i'd be a mm. rebel if i dared to be mm. um and and here he gets to actually act out the part of a rebel there is a funny another funny moment when uh, kimus and the doctor are trying to sneak into the to the bridge which is this building mountain uh and he said kimus says to the doctor says, i don't understand and the doctor says exciting isn't it which is a nice <laughs> little moment because yes yeah, sometimes it's exciting to not understand yet and to, to know that you're going to learn uh so i thought that was fun um they uh at one point i thought they said that the mentias were all former captain's guards but that's no no okay. i don't remember that there was no, a it's, line it's... yeah it's people that just over time, their the latent telepathic ability did come out. Yeah, and of course, so, then the Mentiads are able to find them and bring them into their. Perhaps group. some of them were former Captain Scars, I guess. Yeah, and they do seem to have some telepathy among themselves, like they can they communicate that way with each other. But they're really much more psychokinetics than mm -hmm. telepaths. They have enormous right. psychokinetic abilities you can shoot guns at them you know laser blasters at them it, it, it does nothing and they can then strike back psychically so they they really even though they play up the telepath angle it they're much more psychokinetic yeah at one point the doctors calls them a telepathic gestalt which is mm -hmm, sort mm -hmm. of m more of a so sort of like a psychic hive mind i think is the way he's kind of talking about it or at least their powers combine to be able to produce great effects when you've got a bunch of them together. Well, they, okay. they use a very, uh, very Douglas Adams line, the gestalt generated psychokinetic blast. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is very Douglas Adams. -y. Yeah. Uh, so the people, so, so the captain is not of Zanak. He crash landed mm -hmm. there and took over. Although uh, we are hinted at that he was injured in that crash and somebody, the doctor says, somebody must have healed him. So, and that presumably is Queen Zanxia. Yeah, uh, or uh, one of her underlings. Yeah. But yeah, that, and that's right. why he's a cyborg. Mm. Right. And I do like the fact that it turns out in the end that beneath all that bluster, he kind of did resent Zanxia. He did, he was was planning to overthrow her and you know cast her off her influence over him off and i do like the fact that they they kind of hid that in there as well as her presence as the key villain of this story mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. was it the third the third episode yeah. i think it was well and it was yeah. and it was very subtle you know she started out she was just the nurse she was just you know somebody who was off screen kind of too as uh, too uh Kill, too many too executions. Death, too many yeah. executions is bad for your blood pressure. You know, can't That's have two right. a day. You know, things like that. You know, but just very subtle. But eventually, then all of a sudden, she's sitting in the captain's chair and she's giving commands to the the uh, guards. And then, of course, it's revealed that yeah, she's actually the queen in this this hollow body that she's trying to turn into a real body. She's mm. trying to be a real boy, girl, however you want to put it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah. I like how the doctor tells her her plan to make this holographic body real because she thinks it's almost real. He tries turning it off. He at one point uses, in fact, a holographic version of himself, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, there, and that's fun. You know, he's like waving to his holographic self. Hello there. Hello there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he he can turn off other holograms. He cannot turn off her body. He tries and it just flickers. Um, and she says, it's too late. This, this body is basically almost real now. And he tells her, and he doesn't really go into why, but, um, or they never really pay this off. Uh, but he tells her that her plan to 
to regenerate with this new holographic body and make it real will never work. And he says, I'm an old hand at regenerations. And trust me, this is not how it works. <laughs> right. He says uh, it will require more and more energy until you would require all the matter in the universe to be converted to energy mm -hmm. to, to do it. So yeah. he's like, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just about 140 pounds of energy. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the people of Xanax, themselves don't know what what's going on like they don't even realize that their planet is moving from place to place they just they realize a new golden age of prosperity is declared and then we have the the sky changes the 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 stars the lights in the sky change i think is how they put it yeah um, they don't really know what stars are and the mines are run robotically so they're just told oh the mines have filled up again yay more useless crystals for everyone <laughs> right mm -hmm. right um the uh and that's when, when Ramada is arrested, they have this key piece of technology that is broken, and she identifies it as a, a part of a dematerialization circuit, but huge, but like on a massive scale. Yep. And that's the first hint of what's really going on is this, this planet, which is hollow, is essentially a giant, you know, TARDIS. It, mm -hmm. It's, it, it, it's mm -hmm. not bigger on the inside in, the, in that sense, but just it's a transport that travels through... Well, space, I don't think it travels through time, no. but it does travel through space. Yeah. It's not a it's it's not a time machine because they, they even mock the idea of, of time travel when she reveals it. She you know, Ramana reveals she's a time lord and they travel through time and space and they, they mock the idea of time travel. But they, they it is a uh a, a spaceship that just dematerializes and rematerializes where it needs to go. Yeah. So when the cap when the captain's original ship crashed and he got repaired, they then apparently retrofitted equipment from his ship to be the dematerialization circuit for this planet and so that's how it became the pirate planet was when the captain crashed on it yeah the, by the way they do uh, several on location shoots for this mm -hmm. episode um one is in a welsh coal mine which substitutes for the mine the the mine yep. shafts down um and then a i think a salt mine uh they mm -hmm. might have been in underground and then a power station, which is the engines for the uh, the TARDIS. not just a power station, a, a nuclear, nuclear power power, power station <laughs> that they blow up equipment in. Yeah, <laughs> you can always it, it. It doesn't matter whether it's it's um, Blake Seven or Doctor Who. You can always recognize those, the interiors of nineteen seventies British nuclear power stations. This is. <laughs> This is a very different time. You could never get away with anything like that today. But back then, the seventies, absolutely, you could go into a power plant and blow stuff up. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's like the uh, two thousand nine Star Trek movie where they used uh, a brewery as the engineering section of the Enterprise. Need something that looks really industrial? Go find a big industrial plant. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, so the uh, so they 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 go to the mine. They also go up. I, one thing I really enjoyed was this um, tunnel. When they you know you first get inside the mountain where the bridge is, um, they travel through this. Um, what do you call it? An induction corridor. Oh, the, the tubes that they yeah, it's like okay. So what these are like is it, when you go to airports, sometimes they'll have these people mover walkways where you get on it, and even if you stand still, the walkway will take you to the end of the walkway. You know, it's like a rolling conveyor belt, mm -hmm. and this is like that only much faster, and it stops you. Uh, by canceling your inertia at the end of the journey. So you're like, without moving your legs, you're, you're zooming down this corridor, just standing there, and then it cancels your inertia, so you just step off at the end. But at one point, the doctor yanks a component out, and the two guards that are chasing him and Romana <laughs> don't have their inertia canceled, <laughs> and they go flying into a wall and are knocked out, or possibly killed. Yeah. And the doctor says, Newton's revenge. <laughs> yep. And then later explains to and, and, Romana. And Romana yeah. says, who's Newton? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he explains to her that how he uh, gave Newton the idea for uh, gravity. Oh, and <laughs> that, that was fun because he, yeah. she says, what did you do? And he says, I climbed up a tree and dropped an apple on his head. And this is an apocryphal story, apparently. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the apple story is in real life is apparently apocryphal. But he says, I dropped an apple on his head. And she says, oh, and then he got the idea of gravity. He said, no, he told me to clear out of his apple tree. And I explained it to him over dinner. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was good. Um, 
the doctor at one point uh, when he's captured by the captain explains to him that he can't kill him now because it wouldn't be sporting um i thought that was kind of funny um he's betting his life on you can't kill me now <laughs> <laughs> right right uh the captain's guards are apparently stormtroopers because they can't hit the broad side of a barn with yeah. their uh, laser mm -hmm. guns and kimus who apparently has never shot a gun before and romana and everyone else <laughs> He hits them all with dead shots. So uh, Ramada's a pretty good dead shot. Kimus is a, basically Luke Skywalker, only less whiny. Yeah. <laughs> and there is a deleted scene where Kimus is standing out guard outside the uh, the the front door, and he shoots a shoots a rock. He's doing target <laughs> practice out there as mm. he's waiting. Mm. Yeah, Ramada picks up a gun and kills somebody oh, pretty handily. She she kills the person very handily and. In I was reading in the TARDIS wiki that it's from her reaction, it's it's ambiguous whether she's killed before. And mm -hmm. and in watching her on screen, it's like, yeah, I think that's a fair assessment of her reaction. She doesn't she's certainly not freaked out mm -hmm. by the fact that she's just killed a person. Um she's she's very cool about it. And so she she may have already taken human life. Mm. So uh you mentioned before that Queen Zanxia is suspended in time, like her her old decrepit body just mm -hmm. in a moment before death, between heartbeats, we might say, which mm -hmm. kind of recalls Clara in fa you know, Face the Raven and after that mm -hmm. she's suspended, you know, in between two heartbeats of before death. They think you think that's where they got the idea from? Nah, probably not. Yeah. I mean, who who can say, but yeah. it's a pretty remote callback. I I would think they would that Stephen Moffat's real inspiration was he wants to kill Clara, but not kill Clara. Now, how can I make that work? <laughs> yes. Because, yeah. And Stephen Moffat, no one dies. <laughs> and, 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 and Zanxia, they, they, they make it clear that she is still alive. She's not frozen in time. Yeah. It's yeah. just, she's kind slowed of slowed down, slowed down or in a time loop or something like that, because you see her moving and breathing and everything. Yeah. It's not You're, like it was just a static. It wasn't just a static image of her. In this time loop, you know, yeah, so. it's this is a this is a I think a flaw in the production because she's not you're not meant to be able to see her visibly move. She's supposed to be mm -hmm. like a thousand times slower or something than real time or more. Yeah, and you couldn't see her moving that much if she right. really were. I mean, she must be hyperventilating right now in her own time <laughs> frame. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this is. This, and this might be, it, it's more noticeable now that we're watching it on, you know, 4K TVs with upsampling and all that too, so. Mm. Yeah. And to, in, if, in case we, ha we didn't make it explicit, the whole point of the, of the mining, like these planets, was to get them the vast quantities of mi minerals that are required to keep the time dams in place to sustain her. Like you need planets worth of resources to and keep energy. this going. Yeah, and energy. And so that that's why they're consuming these planets at such a rapid pace. Um, so um, in the end, the doctor, like you mentioned, the doctor you know, stops them. And a Califrax, not Califrax, Xanax, this empty, hollow planet that can fit around other planets, um, is he fills it up with something? What does he use to fill it up? I forget what that was. The other... Um, the the, when when, it, when he rematerialized it and the, the the plant filled up, that was the uh, the other planets that were in, the rem remnants of the other oh. planets that were in his collection, other right. than Califrax. Yeah. Oh, and there's an interesting bit of science, attempted bit of science, um, that um, that Douglas Adams puts into the script when the captain is explaining the shrunken planets. The doctor is overacting and says, "But that's impossible." Because any planet that was shrunk down to the size of a foot would turn mm. into a black hole. It's like, mm. yeah, actually, thanks for the attempt, but actually, no. Um, <laughs> if, if you took the Earth and compressed it to the point that it was a foot in diameter, it would not be a black hole. Maybe neutron matter, but not a black hole. You'd have to compress the entire Earth down to the size of nine millimeters. Mm. For it, so less than a centimeter. This is, and for Americans who aren't familiar with metric, that's less than half an inch. Yeah, right. For about a earth, third of an inch for yeah. the Earth to turn into a black hole. Right. Well, that's pretty darn small. I thought it would even be have to be even smaller, but 
that's still pretty small. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one thing that kind of got me is, so they were sent, the whole point of, of this whole thing was to go to Califrax because that's the second segment to the key of time. If this all hadn't happened, like how, how were they going to get collect the second segment? It's a planet. Like the whole planet oh, is the second segment. I, I assume you stand on the planet surface, you turn on the device, you touch it to the planet and it becomes the key to time. Or and, you just step out, you just stand on the edge of the TARDIS door and go down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the planet disappears and you take the, whatever's, you know, the, the, yep. the, the segment away. Okay. That's all they did when that yeah, we, we don't see it on screen, but that's all they did. So, yeah, I guess so. Okay. All right. Um, it, it was a little, yeah. Okay. I, I can see that now. I was a little confused. Mm -hmm. It's like, how is this supposed to work? Um, oh, so. there are good be there. Uh, this is another thing I like about the series, uh, the key to time series. You know, I like it about this episode that one of the segments of the key to time is a planet Th and I'm not going to spoil what they are, but, mm -hmm. um, Dom, be prepared for some additional <laughs> surprises uh, regarding oh, yes. what is the key to time segment thereafter. Yeah. It okay. is, it's there's there's a real Lulu coming up. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not just little pieces of gemstones sitting in a display case like the first yeah. one was. Okay. It's like the Horcruxes from Harry Potter. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if that's where she got the idea. Anyway. <laughs> So, any other thoughts, any other notes on this series, The Pirate Planet, Father Corey? So, one kind of funny funny thing is the, the front door to the bridge is actually a disused railway tunnel in, the whale, in Wales. They actually just filled in the tunnel with their little false front, uh -huh. and that's where they filmed at. Well, they said that, of course, it's in a hill, and people are standing up on top of the hill watching all the, the filming and, you know, making comments and stuff as they were <laughs> they're filming. Um, and then one thing we didn't mention is you'll notice the doctor has injury on his lip. His lip was mm -hmm. cut. And of course they show it in scene where the TARDIS is shaking and he smacks into the console. Well, what actually happened is when they were filling the ribose operation, the previous one, uh, Paul said, who played the, uh, played Vindicay, Paul Seed, excuse me, who played Vindicay, the, 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 the Griff, the, the, the bad Graf. guy, mm -hmm. Graf, excuse me, Graf, um, his dog bit. Tom Baker on and the mouth on the mouth. And Tom Baker didn't mention it until they were on the bus going to Wales to film the first scene, which was all the scenes in the power station. So they had to write in that the doctor smacked his face on the console and that's what caused the injury. Right. And that was, but the ribose operation was, they were supposed to, these were supposed to be, filmed opposite so this was supposed to explain why the doctor had the cut in his lip yeah. in the ribos operation and then they f they switched them back well it, it happened during it okay during the filming of it oh i see i see and it wasn't so, healing it wasn't healing well enough that it would be gone okay so they're trying to explain it now even though we've seen it throughout the previous and that that was episode, again yeah. you know f production issues there right right i got it i get it but that's why you see him smack yeah. his head into the console because he had to give some cover for it. It's small enough they could have just ignored it and people would assume, oh, he must have had a minor injury off camera, yeah. you know, or the doctor must have had a minor injury when, when we weren't following his adventures. Exactly. Right. right. And uh, one, one last thing is, you know, as a kid, my favorite scene was canine trying to kill the parrot and then eventually <laughs> becoming a good retriever dog and, and doing it. <laughs> and I love that they literally stuck the parrot on its blaster nose <laughs> yeah, there's no real way canine could pick it up, but they and and put it on his nose like that. But it's still it's still cool. But yeah, that was just a little clever scene. It's it supposedly again from the behind the scenes interviews. Uh, it took like four hours for them to figure out how to film that in a way that would look good. And it was actually <laughs> Douglas Adams' half brother, younger half brother, who was much younger than him. He was only like ten years old, and he's the one who came up with the parrot and the idea of canine killing the parrot chasing the parrot and killing it and i guess when the uh when the crew found out when this 10 year old told them because he was at the filming they were less than impressed they weren't too happy <laughs> about the idea apparently someone stole the prop during filming and then they <laughs> then they found it later uh hidden in a dumpster <laughs> yeah they, they weren't too happy about this stupid bird <laughs> jimmy any uh, final thoughts 
There's a line in in one of the later episodes. I forget exactly how it goes, but there's a line in one of the later episodes where I, the doctor refers to the Mentiads using their psychokinetic powers to bend a fork. And I believe mm-hmm. it's Kima says, why would anyone want to bend a fork? And the doctor says, I have no idea. <laughs> But this episode came out in 1978, and so that's the 1970s, and in 19, like 73, Yuri Geller, the Israeli magician and psychic, had become famous for bending spoons and forks and things like that, which we mm-hmm. actually had an episode of Mysterious World on, and because I attended a spoon-bending party and got results I was not expecting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely check that one out, folks. Yuri Geller... Probably not actually using psychic powers to bend things. Well, but I, it, it depends it, on the occasion. Mm-hmm. Yuri Geller, at least according to the people who have studied him, um, he is a magician, but he also can perform under controlled conditions. Where So it's like he seems to, at least according to the people who've studied him, He can do some psychic things, but he also just does magic. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So this would have been topical at the time. People would have thought of spoon bending fork. It was was a, it was a rage at the time. Okay, cool. All right. So that's it for the pirate planet. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Dr. Who, including Brantley M, James D, Matt L, Matthew F and Steve S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So that's it from us. We'd love to know what you thought of The Pirate Planet. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or The Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page or send an email to who at sqpn.com, or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who in video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the first Doctor story, Galaxy 4. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. Thanks, Tom. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, good looks is no substitute for a sound character. <laughs>